Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. It will really help to increase the popularity of our content in YouTube's algorithm. It's never been more important to understand the motives and techniques of the world's propagandists. Chief among them are the troll factories of Russian state TV and the Moscow Kremlin, spewing bile and hate throughout its war of aggression with Ukraine and over the last 10 plus years. My guest today, Olga Lautman, is an expert in the corrosive effects of propaganda, something she has tackled head on in the incredible podcast Kremlin file, which she co-hosts. Olga is a national security researcher and analyst concentrating on the cross-section of organized crime and intelligence operations in Russia and Ukraine, as well as their impact on Western democratic practices. She is a senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Olga maintains her expertise on the kleptocratic dealings of Russia's ruling elite, on its intelligence agencies, and has a sophisticated understanding of Soviet political history and Russia's transition post-collapse. Her fluency in Russian helps her monitor Kremlin-aligned media and social media trends to track and disrupt Russian disinformation operations and active measures campaigns. Now, we could say so much more about your incredible experience and knowledge, but let's get started on the questions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you uh, first, for having me. No, huge pleasure. Thank you, Olga. So first, please uh, tell me something about your podcast. When and why did you start it? And what is the ideal audience you're looking for uh, when you create your Kremlin file content? So I actually started the podcast because of U.S. media, because when Russia attacked U.S. elections in 2016, somehow the media turned it into a Republican versus Democrat issue. And, you know, they never delved into the fact that Russia for a few decades, well, I mean, even going back to Soviet Union days, but say with just the uh, period with Putin, for a few decades have been uh, attempting to subvert democracies around the globe. And by the time that Russia attacked our 2016 election in the United States, I think we were like the 37th country. So... A lot of people didn't understand. It polarized the nation. You know, you had a lot of Republicans who became suddenly pro-Putin without understanding that his goal is to destroy America, as was the goal of the Soviet Union. Nothing changed. And that's why I decided to do the podcast just to show you know, the bigger picture that, you know, what Russia's active measures are, how they conduct their hybrid warfare. And also, you know, uh, I'll give examples from every country starting. I started the podcast with Russia's neighbors, uh, Ukraine, Estonia, Georgia, um, others that Russia has attacked using their disinformation and different hybrid warfare tactics. Um, and then kind of moved out until we got to the United States. And I wanted to show that this is a very common practice, you know, because it's important for people to know. As far as my audience, my audience is, you know, regular people in households who don't have an understanding of Russia and who don't understand, you know, the autocratic system and who potentially I would love to reach people who actually are in favor of installing an autocratic system for them to see what a real autocracy is. Because it's very easy, you know, to sit in America and say, yes, we want this, you know, type of system without actually experiencing what that is. Absolutely. It's difficult to imagine, isn't it, uh, how far different uh, an autocratic society is from a Western society. And I think uh, people on both the left and the right can often sort of conflate issues they're experiencing uh, and say, well, you know, the difference is not that great, but it's, it's worlds apart, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you take the COVID, you know, mask mandate. 
here, people were screaming, my freedom, my freedom, you know, for something that is a mask that goes over in order to prevent a deadly pandemic from, um, you know, spreading. Whereas in Russia, you can't even open your mouth because you just get jailed. And, you know, if you have more influence, if you're a journalist or opposition, then you are possibly, you know, the regime will try to assassinate you. I mean, there's a very big difference. And I mean, even for regular protesters here, you know, yes, we have issues of police brutality against protesters. I do agree, and that needs to be tackled. But in Russia, you go to protest, your life is destroyed. They will threaten to take your children away. They will, you know, put you on a list where it potentially ruins your future and employment opportunities. And I mean, it literally, they brought back Soviet tactics. This is what it was like in the Soviet Union. And this is what's happening now, even to the point, I mean, during Brezhnev uh, uh, era, he, you know, used uh, uh, schizophrenia as a, a means to, you know, to, to, um, let me repeat that. During Brezhnev area, he would, uh, you know, say that dissidents had schizophrenia if they attempted to question the, the government or the regime and the policies or even discuss even a simple question. And they would be put away into psychiatric wards for schizophrenia, pumped with drugs. And now Putin has brought the same practice back. And, you know, we've seen it started in the outskirts of Moscow and, you know, other cities to the point that we've seen it as an increasing practice. I mean, here, whatever we say about our governments, you know, if you come out to protest against or for something, they're not gonna throw you into a mental institution and destroy your future. That's right, and I believe Solzhenitsyn did actually write one of his uh, band works on that very topic, wasn't it? Uh, I think they also used cancer as, uh, as one of these sort of labels as well to lock people up. So turning to some things, I and mean, there's a lot to unpack in what you've said there, but the first question uh, really relates back to the 2016 election. How active were the measures deployed against the US, in your view? Oh, Russia used everything that they had in their toolkit. And look, a lot of people, you know, boil down to memes that, oh, Russia put out memes. How could that possibly change, you know, what was happening? First of all, Russia took interest into U.S. politics. Again, we're talking in recent history because they've always had interest in disrupting U.S. internal affairs, going back to the Soviet Union. But they took interest in uh, U.S. Uh, internal affairs in 2008, right after Obama uh, was elected, and they saw, you know, like a fringe right begin to rise and, and voice their racist views. And Russia doesn't create, you know, our divisions. Russia doesn't create the problems in our society. Russia looks for them, and then they'll latch on, and they'll, you know, like literally pour fuel on a fire to the point that we get to a point where we're so polarized that we can't even, you know, family members can't speak to each other. And a democracy so, um, is more vulnerable to that. Sorry to jump in, but democracy yeah. is, he's basically using our systems against us, isn't he? They weaponize our freedoms. I mean, this is a problem because like we have, you know, first uh, amendment rights, which rightfully so, this is what uh, differentiates us from an autocracy, but they weaponize it. And, you know, with the first uh, amendment rights, you saw how they weaponized social media over the past decade, you know, under the guise of First Amendment rights and protection of everyone can say what it is. Problem is, you don't even know who you're arguing with because, you know, someone who's posing in Alabama and, and sitting and saying that, you know, all, all liberals need to disappear could be really a troll in St. Petersburg who's writing this, you know, but at the same time trying to kind of make an inroads with the people they're targeting. And Russia also uses micro-targeting. So they look for specific vulnerabilities online. I mean, literally, it's the same methods they use as terrorist organizations who indoctrinate, you know, seek out vulnerable people and then indoctrinate them. And cults. And there's a, there's a yes. common set of practices, yep. aren't there, across different spectra? Yes. 
Yep. Now you mentioned a figure as well, because of course, one of the big debates in uh, in the US is to somehow think that this is exceptional. Uh, and of course it gets weaponized uh, across the left and the right of the spectrum. Um, but you say that the US is not unique, that actually these techniques were honed on many countries uh, before the US were targeted. Um, what are some notable examples? And of course, I'm thinking here about the Yellow Vest protests, about uh, you know Black Lives Matter across the world and the weaponizing of that. And then of course, very controversial example in the UK, which is Brexit. Yeah, and Russia actually started again way before because Putin spent his first two terms, you know, uh, seeking uh, to to solidify his power, and then by 2007 is when you see him venturing first time outside. And the first country who was, I mean, who really felt the blunt effect of it was Estonia. When Estonia decides to take a Soviet monument, you know, or statue, and and move it to the outskirts of their city. Um, Russia immediately started not only a disinformation campaign to the point that, I mean, there were protests and it just got very ugly, but they also hit Estonia with probably one of the most devastating cyber attacks. And it was probably the first massive cyber attack from a state actor against another state, you know, another state of the time. And then from there, we just saw it venture out. I mean, 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. Again, same disinformation operation, same, you know, uh, tactics that they used in Ukraine. And then we saw the move to Ukraine. We saw Brexit. I mean, in Montenegro, they, um, you know, weren't happy with the prime minister. So they had a Russian intelligence plot to just assassinate him, which got disrupted. Uh, France... Again, you know, our famous thing with elections was the DNC being hacked. Russia has hacked French uh, um, election officials before election. Um, Russia has hacked, you know, uh, during uh, which I call, I think it's called Watergate in Poland, where they um, taped the uh, pro-Western, pro-U.S. party and um then they taped their scandalous conversations that were private in restaurants and then ended up releasing them. And this is what Russia does. I mean, they every time prior to elections, same thing with German, both elections, U.S., every single time there are elections, they have their favorable candidates. And then they will try to destroy the other candidate by hacking into the uh, into their emails, you know, and then not only do they disseminate the emails that they're choosing and in their narrative, they also fabricate some of the emails. So you don't even know what is coming out, what is real, what is not real. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say by the time, you know, we got to U.S., it was there was <laughs> it was literally the same exact method that mm -hmm. Russia had used between disinformation, between cyber attacks, between, you know, polarizing societies. In 2003, um, in Ukraine, we, you know, suddenly got so angry before the Orange Revolution. And it, it just got like the, it got so polarized the society and nobody could understand what was happening until later on, you know, we found out that it was uh, Russian intelligence services who, ran a, you know, these uh, dis division operations, mm -hmm. disinformation and division operations in order to split the society. So, I mean, and Russia's neighbors have been the testing ground for it. So everything that the West has seen is, you know, was uh, tried and <laughs> tested in uh, Russia's neighbors. And as you say, they didn't create these issues, but they've stuck a crowbar into a fault line that was already there or thrown petrol onto the fire. Um, and that tactic seems to be especially effective. Um, I believe they also, they don't necessarily even need to convert someone to their point of view, sowing confusion, doubt, uh, and even apathy is another tactic, isn't it? Absolutely. And as far as they don't create divisions, you know, I mean, our vulnerabilities, that is correct. But for instance, perfect example, what Russia will do is say we have, you know, Black Lives Matter protests, and then you have White Lives Matter protests, Russian trolls, you know, being Russian intelligence services, will go and create events 
now physical events, not online, at the same exact place at the same exact time in order to have both groups come in order to try to stir violence and chaos. Uh, and and the apathy as well. I mean, not just yeah. getting anger, but also the tactic is there to sow confusion and apathy. Yeah. So Russia, um, their intelligence services with disinformation, their number one thing is to target, and they're excellent at this, is to target emotion. They well, and this is why you see, especially in the United States, how popular memes were, because they want to target emotion. And you see the same thing happening even, you know, when they um, invade countries, they'll release fake videos of, you know, staged events, which we've seen and which have been debunked by, you know, independent sources. Um, but they want to, they don't want to get you to a point where you think. First, they want to get you to react. And this is where you're like, oh, my God, whatever it is, anger, whatever it is. And this is why they pose as local citizens, because they want you to see, you know, someone who's posing, for instance, as an American or a British uh, saying scandalous, you know, provocative things. And you're like, oh, my God, how is this person like, well, you know, these are the people I live amongst. Meanwhile, they're not. And then their other goal is to, especially when it comes to their atrocities and what they're trying to cover is to throw so many narratives out there even if they're contradicting they don't care i mean we saw this with mh17 we saw this you know with syria they don't care how you know whether it's contradicting they just want to confuse you to the point that you like throw your hands up in the air and like i i don't understand what's happening that's it I, I give up and then you kind of look away. Mm -hmm. So they have, you know, two directions. One where they actually want to push you to believe something or to kind of, you know, even if you do believe it, they want to um, kind of, uh, what is that word? To, to support it, to give you the mm -hmm. support for it. That way you believe it's correct. Like for instance, you see with the COVID masks, you had people who went from online possibly said, you know, to themselves, you know, I don't want to wear a mask. It's annoying. And then from there, it went to now you're being having this reinforced by a group of people who are saying it. And then from there, but these group of people partly, you know, are Russian trolls and bots who are reinforcing what you think. And then it takes it from whereas you initially, you know, just thought it was an annoying concept that you have to wear a mask to the point that you're out in front of schools burning masks. And this is the, the direction they want to take. And from masks to books. And so it goes on, yeah. doesn't it? And burn everything. Absolutely. And they've also become more, um, their new disinformation operations have been trending towards more violence. You know, so whereas the first decade they were kind of just trying to uh, sow division in societies, now you actually see them trying to cause these individuals to go out and commit violence. We've seen this in U.S., we've seen this in um, Brazil, and pretty much, you know, anytime you see violent protests erupt and out of nowhere, you can, you know, you can bet that Russia's involved and they've proven to be. Yeah. And there's some great organizations starting to do the forensic discovery, isn't there, on, on uh, uh, looking for the sort of fingerprints over uh, the conspiracies and the communications around it. But something you just said, I think, really does uh, lead into my next question very well. And that really is the difference between the Cold War uh, and, and now. Because, of course, spying by Russia on America uh, and its allies and vice versa has been going on since the 1930s. But what is the real difference between those activities, say in the Cold War, and from the 2010s onwards under Putin? Well, I mean, there are two differences. I think one is the blame is on us, the West, because during the Cold War, you know, the West had a very uh, clear foreign policy towards the Soviet Union. They understood the Soviet Union was a threat. They understood communism was a threat. And basically anyone, you know, found to, to be working with the Soviet Union was deemed a traitor to their country. And it was a very, very clear policy. And, you know, and 
for the most part, you know, and this is why we saw uh, even to the point that eventually the collapse happened. Um, as far as uh, now, we have no clear foreign policy. I mean, literally, we have watched Russia conduct atrocities, starting from Putin's rise to power. Putin came into power killing 300 citizens. Him and his FSB blew up apartment buildings in order to get to power. He gets into power and then he goes to Chechnya. What does he do to Chechnya? The same scenes we see coming out of Ukraine right now. He levels Grozny. And then from there, it just continued murdering journalists who were investigating Chechnya, um, you know, murdering dissidents like Libanenko on, on British soil with a, with a chemical weapon. Uh, attempting to murder the murder the Skripals on British soil with a chemical weapon, and they screwed up and ended up, you know, murdering a British citizen. So the problem is not as much as Russia because they're continuing the same things during the Cold War. I mean, there there is a, two main differences of why they're more successful. One, during the Cold War, we didn't have the technology. So, you know, whereas uh, the KGB wanted to influence you, they place ads or, you know, like influence local newspapers, but it didn't have that much of an effect. Now they've weaponized social media and they can literally spread disinformation to billions in, you know, a matter of hours. So that was the number one thing. They didn't have the reach. I mean, the but as far as their tactics, they were the same. I mean, you saw all the disinformation operations around HIV. You saw all the disinformation operations around JFK, around Martin Luther King. So their tactics were identical. They just didn't have the same exact reach. The second thing is they didn't have the money. And again, because we had a clear containment policy, you know, people weren't taking money from the Soviet Union to uh, sit there and peddle Soviet talking points. Now, over the past two decades, we don't have that. So now you have Putin who has invested a lot of money into Westerners. And I mean, it ranges from everything. And he's using, again, the KGB head in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, had done a metal memo in 1984, recruit everyone, you know, like they widened the recruitment process from, you know, just technical experts on nuclear issues and, and scientists and, you know, intelligence and law enforcement to now recruit anyone who's influential and has any kind of influence. Putin is using the same tactics, except now he could pay them. And now you have people from media, from government, from, I mean, literally in every facet of our society, people are in one way or another on the Kremlin's uh, payroll, or they're just, you know, being uh, brainwashed on social media to repeat the talking points without even realizing what they're doing. So it's either they're complicit or they're useful idiots. And I think those are the two biggest things, just because, I mean, you see the amount of money and you constantly see, you know, can you imagine during um, the Soviet Union, like a, a, a German chancellor going to sit on the Soviet, you know, board? <laughs> now we had Schroeder and not only was he sitting on the board, but he was also doing everything to push Kremlin foreign policy inside of Germany. Even now, he's still even now the talks Absolutely. and normalization of relations. Um, yeah. This raises, I think, a very difficult and probably libelous question. So I need to be very careful with this. Uh, mm -hmm. um, they also have something that perhaps we no longer have, which is the ability to invest over a much longer period. You know, Putin has seen leaders come and go in every single country, including the US. Uh, and he's still there on, on the throne, as it were. Um, uh, so, you know, they're able to invest in assets. They're able to look at long-term objectives, uh, if indeed yep. they, they have long-term objectives. And sometimes it seems to be a bit tactical. Um, and this is where it leads to a difficult situation, isn't it? Because it is alleged that uh, if they're trying to recruit anyone who can be of influence, then Trump very clearly, for all his faults, was clearly a person of influence um, for many decades. 
Absolutely. And that's another people thing people don't, um, you know, understand. And I think it's because they watch too many Hollywood movies or read too many spy novels, because when they think of a, a Russian, you know, agent, they think of, you know, someone who's like running and putting something in a drop area and marking an X on a rock and, you know, and that's it and passing information. An agent could be anything and an agent doesn't necessarily need to be kind of recruited in a way to, for instance, you know, prime Trump. So going to Trump, for instance, Trump started dealing with Russian organized crime in the 80s and he continued. All his money came from there. Every single property was, you know, between Russian intelligence officers and Russian organized crime members and, you know, Russian link uh, Kremlin politicians um, who were living in all his properties. The money was coming from there. So they didn't use Trump, for instance. They didn't, you know, approach him in the 1980s and say, aha, uh -huh, look, we have the perfect guy who one day in 40 years is going to run for president. We need to stick with him. At that time, he did have influence. And a lot of people don't even realize because that's another thing that our media did, you know, was to fail vetting Trump. But I mean, in 1980s, Trump, you know, wanted a Soviet post as an ambassador. He wanted to fix the nuclear issue. I mean, it was extremely bizarre for a playboy businessman, in, you know, in Manhattan to suddenly say, I want to fix the nuclear issue. He had an obsession with Gorbachev. I mean, who in America, even at that time, you know, paid attention to Gorbachev besides foreign policy experts. You know, um, so there were kind of very questionable things then. Then he went to the Soviet Union in 87, came back. Everyone in Manhattan knew that Trump was very, you know, stingy, but he spent his own money to place ads that actually a former KGB person told me were was an active measure by KGB and that a memo went around inside of KGB at the time that they celebrated you know, this placement of ads because it advocated for us basically, you know, weakening our relations with our allies and whatnot. And then they continued, you know, then after that, the Soviet Union collapsed. They continued using him as like a money laundering cow. He had real estate. He has absolutely zero mor morals. He has no problem, you know, committing endless crimes. He doesn't care. I mean, his in 1984, a Russian who uh, was mafia walked in and bought, um, I believe, what, five apartment building? I mean, five apartments, six million cash in a suitcase. Did he ask, where did this cash come from? What is it? No, he just took it. Oh, wow, wonderful. And that's it. That was his actually first taste of, you know, this type of uh, thing in 1984. Yeah. But neither um, did Deutsche Bank or the regulators ask any <laughs> questions either, which is a real problem, no. isn't it? It is a huge problem. And from there, it just continued. I mean, he, you saw, you know, the money, money, launder, money laundering through Trump properties by the Kazakhstan government. Um, you saw the money laundering by, you know, um, Putin's uh, party in Ukraine, um, party of regions with the former president Yanukovych, who is, um, I don't know about now because of the war, but was on trial for treason after trying to, you know, subvert democracy inside of Ukraine and then fleeing to Russia when he failed. Um, so you saw him doing that. And then, of course, eventually Russia was like, you know what? He's running for president. He's going to have, you know, favorable outlook towards us because he's a gangster. And this is how he thinks. He doesn't believe in law. He doesn't believe, like, just even with regular things. I mean, he would try to pay off prosecutors in New York and just, you know, even in, in Florida um, in order to, to make things go his way. This is just who he is. So, of course, when, you know, he's running for president, Russia wants someone like him versus what? Hillary Clinton, who, um, you know, they still can't get over that she said that Putin, you know, is evil and that he's dangerous and, and whatnot. So this is what, you know, we saw. So again, they started with him in the 80s, but it wasn't for a specific one 40-year plot of like, okay, we're going to, you know, stick with him and put him into power into president. It kind of, you know, he was just in their orbit, orbit and that's it. And then they 
laundered money, conducted different operations, and eventually he did run for president. They were like perfect and did everything to put him in. Of course, and uh, like, uh, like a gambler, they probably had several chips on the table. He probably wasn't their only uh, candidate for that. It was a bit of a, a long shot, I would have said. Um, so Russia seems capable of weaponizing everything. I think we've sort of established that definitely. Everything, food, to- energy. Migrant, Energy, everything. food, culture. I mean, those are exactly the things I was going to mention there. How effective are those strategies? And will they be self-defeating in the end? They will be self-defeating for Russia then, because finally, you know, I was in a very lone camp, you know, screaming about these operations for a long time. And it was like literally going against a tsunami because... People just didn't listen, but I think Russia finally crossed the line of causing like, you know, the biggest atrocities and and genocide since World War II that people have woken up. And now that people are paying attention to Russia, you know, I think that it is going to destroy them because before they were doing these, you know, operations but there was there wasn't much attention being paid to them. And now even I see, you know, people on social media at least in my orbit of social media, watching, you know, like translated Russian shows with the insanity they're saying. And and you see the outrage by the West. And I'm like, this is what they have been saying since the 1990s. I mean, literally, there's nothing. It's just now they're a little bit, you know, more. But these are the same exact talking points, you know? I mean, and, and that's what... Like that was what how Russia succeeded besides paying off people is because, you know, people weren't paying attention and they were counting on the West being too preoccupied with their own issues. You know, everyone's busy with their own things as should be in a democracy. I mean, in a democracy, for the most part, I mean, now people have to step up and fight to to um make sure our democracies around the globe don't collapse. But I mean, you know, you're not supposed to be uh, in a democracy, you know, like sitting and worried about, you, you know, uh, hey, for, uh, foreign enemies who are trying to destroy you. Most people were preoccupied with their own personal lives. But now everyone's paying attention and everybody sees Russia for who it is. And no matter how much they try to whitewash their operations, they just committed a terrorist attack, you know, in a shopping mall. Um, the world sees them for who they are. And the more what's more interesting because it's like really Putin for 20 years laid out these operations and kind of like you know like with what he did with Ukraine it kind of disrupted a lot of his operations and it also turned the hatred on towards Russia and now no matter like whereas before they are you know during MH17 and Russia's invasion of Crimea and annexation and eastern Ukraine in 2014 and their atrocities in Syria before their disinformation operations could whitewash out to the point people were getting confused now there's just so much attention on Ukraine that you know it's a, a drop harder for Putin and the more he gets pushed the more he's lashing out I mean I believe I think yesterday was he was lashing out at Turkey. You know, he's already threatened Lithuania. He's threatened every anybody and everybody. So, I mean, at this point, he just looks like a toddler who's like ready to, sell, you know, set the world on fire. That's right. And I, uh, I was watching uh, a number of videos yesterday of people trying to understand why the shopping center was hit. You know, one point of view is that they were aiming at a military target, that there was a rational reason behind it. It could have been a tractor factory or the bridge nearby. And then another point of view, which actually was a minority one, but I think it was someone being interviewed by Navalny's team. He said, it's very, very simple. Norway agreed to supply long range missiles uh, or some other missile system he'd been deployed for the first time. And this was simply revenge, pure, simple revenge i would even go further and say that it's even more simple than that i mean the west was extremely shocked that russia's military underperformed and anyone from the region you know um knew that their military sucks just because of the 
corruption inside of Russia. Um, but I would make it for, you know more simple. This is their tactic. This is what they've done. This is what they did in the Soviet Union. And this is what they did after, uh, you know, when Russia started using their military. Their military is to target civilians strategically. Mm -hmm. They want to break civilians. They did this in Syria. They, they destroyed cities. They target humanitarian corridors. They target shopping centers. And they want civilians because the more panic there is among civilians, the more they are counting on these civilians either just, you know, stop protesting or, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, ignore what is happening and say, I can't, you know, my life is too important. I need to abandon this and, and I'm not going to fight for my country. And this is what they've done. This is the Russian military tactic. That's it. It's not even revenge. It's what they do anytime. I mean, you've seen, I remember I went on uh, throughout March and April and I happened to go on, you know, to British media at night, my time in New York. Um, and they're like, oh, Russia agreed to, you know, tomorrow for a humanitarian corridor. How do you think that'll go? I'm like, they're going to bomb it. And, and they looked like I'm crazy. Sure enough, next day, Russia targeted the humanitarian corridor because they want to terrorize people in order to achieve their goals. And this is... Um... This is one of the, the terrifying things, not just of this war, but watching the events of January the 6th in Washington DC unfold. There is a continuous attempt by both lawmakers who may or may not understand what's going on, but especially the media to normalize the situation. However dire and terrifying it is to try and bring it back to some kind of logical explanation that fits within their framework. And in this instance, yeah. fits within a Western democratic framework and the logic that underpins politicians' decisions. Isn't that a fundamental risk here? Because Putin does not operate on that level of logic. Absolutely. And that is probably one of the biggest things, you know, sometimes media does it intentionally. Sometimes they do it, you know, they don't realize what they're doing. But I think the biggest, you know, failure um, as far as with foreign policy, just across all levels of society and government and media, is uh, the failure to ima of imagination. And, you know, they, everyone thinks with a Western mentality. And my perfect example to this is the West, you know, a normal civilized people, not even the West, just civilized people, if there is a problem, they want to sit down and they want to try to talk this problem out. Russia will try, sit down with you and they'll exploit it and they will, you know, turn it into a Russian intelligence operation where they can seek your vulnerabilities, weaknesses and figure out how they could use what they just obtained from the meeting in order to harm you later. That's it. And people fail to imagine this, you know, which is a good thing. I mean, it's, a, it, it, you know, that w there wouldn't be a difference between a democracy and autocracy if Westerners actually understood this. But it also is, you know, it, it hurts our chances of fighting Russia when you can't understand the enemy you're fighting. And that's been one of my biggest grievances, you know, well, one of many, is that people do not think how Russia is. Like, you know, we would never bomb a daycare center ever like you know, we would never say Absolutely. yeah we would never say you know what that says look there's a daycare center we need to um, target it we would never walk in to a country and kidnap uh, uh, you know a few hundred thousand people including children and and you know rip up their passports their identity and ship them into another country and say that's it your past life doesn't exist. Your mom, your dad, they don't exist. Now you're going to be under our rule mm -hmm. and this is what you're going to learn. You know, we would never do that. Russia does. I mean, this is, mm. and it's nothing new. It's not Putin. This is, you know, centuries of this kind of rule. So, I mean, and that's yeah. the problem. That, I mean, that, to that be controversial, um, Trump clearly has a great admiration uh, okay. for autocrats. And on a very small scale, but nonetheless with chilling echoes of Ukraine, he did sort of do that, didn't he, on the Mexican border by splitting children up, putting them in cages, and in some instances, 
destroying, uh, whether it's just through incompetence or design, I don't know, but uh, making it very difficult to then find who were the parents of those children. So you could see some of those techniques perhaps playing out in his thinking, whether it's instinctive or strategic, you can make that connection, can't you? Absolutely. I think he's both. I think everything he did, you know, for our media, for some reason, they, you know, Trump told them, just like Putin, Trump told them, you know, every step of the way, what he's going to do. He never hid anything. He didn't make it a secret. He very clearly called for armed insurrection, you know, even prior to January 6th. You know, he called for his militia. He wanted a private militia. Um, and everything he did, he said it in the open, but our media is like, oh my God, that is so outrageous. No, he doesn't mean it until he did it. And he did this year after year after year. Same thing with Putin. People, you know, foreign policy makers are scratching their head. Why would Putin do this? I don't understand. Putin has told us for two decades, Ukraine doesn't exist. He has said Ukraine doesn't exist. They've said it on TV for I mean, even more than two decades, but say, take, you know, Putin's rule. Ukraine doesn't exist. The Soviet Union was the biggest catastrophe, the collapse of it. We need to reinstate our empire, you know, and bring back the states. And not only did he do it, he, uh, did he say it, they have been doing it. I mean, annexing Georgia, annexing Ukraine in, you know, 2014, Crimea, and then occupying eastern Ukraine, 7% of Ukraine's territory. Um, you know, Belarus, softly annexing Belarus, because honestly, we all, I mean, Belarus was actually after Ukraine failed in 2014 for him to seize, you know, more than he wanted because he wanted Kharkiv at the time, Odessa, and, you know, more cities, he failed to get them. Um, he moved towards Belarus. And I mean, they've always had it in their strategy to bring Belarus back into the fold. But then you have the 2019 elections and this was, you know, going on for decades. I mean, for decades, for years, uh, from like 2018 when they started focusing, really focusing on Belarus and that's it. And I mean, then the protests came. Lukashenko clearly, you know, lost the election um, and had, was, uh, you know, had to figure out a way how to keep power. Russia sent Russian intelligence services in order to secure his power. And that's it. And now he has to pretty much do and say what they want. And I had warned last year that because I was watching, you know, Russia's intentions of launching a full scale war against Ukraine from February of 2020, when they started moving their military on the borders. And I was saying that, you know, we have to keep an eye on Belarus because Belarus, not only did Putin expand his, you know, military playground, he potentially could even expand his military with a Belarusian military. And sure enough, this is what they did. And Putin never hid it. That's, you know, he never hid this. He told us what he, you know, his intentions were. People here just thought it was so outrageous. They're like, no, that can't be, you know, I'll ignore it. And that's it. And same thing with Trump. He, everything he told us he was going to do, and he did. Absolutely. And uh, that's something his uh, supporters admire, <laughs> and his detractors are, are, are sort of horrified by that. And I think there's an interesting convergence as well, isn't there, on both the far right and the far left in the US and in Europe, which is to fail to see these steps towards what's happened now. And they see... Uh, no agency on the part of Ukraine, and Ukraine is just a pawn. Uh, it's as if it doesn't have any kind of decision-making power itself uh, to move towards the West, um, and they uh, blame NATO. Uh, and in many people's minds, maybe fewer than there were back in February, but there's a lot of people who still believe that NATO is more culpable for this war than Putin himself is, ignoring entirely what Putin has said all along, that his aims are clearly imperialistic. Absolutely. And it was interesting that you mentioned the far left, because when before Russia's invasion, they started the disinformation operations via the far left, because, you know, they had used the fringe left and the fringe right 
The fringe right is more new, actually, it's the past decade, I would say, whereas the fringe left they've been using since Soviet days. And here for this, they specifically, you know, started putting out the disinformation last fall through the far left. And I mean, NATO, this is the furthest argument. The man, you know, compared himself to Peter the Great recently. You know, he again sat in, in uh, the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, just in case people didn't hear the first 15 times, to say that, you know, we need to restore the, the, uh, Russia and all Soviet territory pretty much belongs to us. He, they have been saying this, you know, and the fact that, you know, they blame NATO for it. NATO has never stepped, first of all, NATO has never stepped one centimeter onto Russian uh, soil, not one. Russia in the past you know, few decades have already uh, encroached and, and, and annexed quite a few of their neighbors and then caused just a complete you know, chaos across all of Europe and US and Canada and whatnot. And second of all, this has never been about NATO. Russia wanted, you know, throughout NATO just because they love to, to have the narrative and to cause destruction. It's another, you know, Russian intelligence tactics and Soviet days. So they just threw out NATO. And then you had all these serious foreign policymakers sitting throughout November, throughout December. Well, maybe we need to listen to Russia. What, what would you like to listen? Would you like to hand back the Baltics to Russia? Like, what, what is it exactly that you want to listen? Because they, it's not about NATO. It's about Russia restoring their lost territory. Just like perfect example, Russia has always supported, you know, um, secession movements, especially in US. And we saw that, you know, Putin's but butcher, Prigozhin, who runs Wagner Mercenaries and at the same time has run troll farms, um, you know, they were behind these uh, secession movements in, for instance, take US in, um, in uh, Texas and California, and then we've seen it across Europe. Why? Because that is their revenge. They think that we're the ones who may, were behind the downfall of uh, Russia and behind the, I mean, the Soviet Union and behind the downfall of, you know, all the uh, former Soviet countries becoming independent and moving forward. So it's basically revenge. And again, Putin over decades has said that he wants to seek revenge for this and his hardliners, not only him. And I think his views are shared by a lot of people. I think another myth in this war is that somehow this is him driving it that it's his own grievances uh, and hatreds. I think that word is fair. Um, but actually the impulse, the desire to regain empire, the desire to have power, control, prestige, that is something shared by a large part of the Russian population, isn't it? Absolutely, not only shared by the, a large part of the Russian population because they're literally brainwashed from like, you know, the minute they could speak, um, to view Russia as the superior power in the world and Russia as, you know, the, the almighty and the best. But it's also the hardliners. And the hardliners, you know, from, again, they're all Soviet era relics. They um, will not stop. They'll use all means to get, you know, what they want. So it definitely is far beyond Putin. And I've said a million times, you know, Putin, there's one Putin, uh, for one Putin, there's another hundred Putins, and some of them could be even more crazy. With that said, if Putin dropped dead tomorrow, you know, I do believe the war would stop just because they would be too busy, you know, shooting each other inside Russia for power. Um, and but the threat wouldn't go away, the thinking wouldn't go away, and the system is just so corrupt. And this, like, the system needs to be broken in order for the country to, you know, move forward. But on our end, and you know, and this saying is half Russian on our end, it's not our problem to fix the system there, and our end, it is to contain Russia. Period. And that's it. And when they decide that they've had enough of this and, you know, decide to actually take a democratic path and we see that they've, you know, proved that they're on a democratic path. It's not, you know, like how Putin installed Medvedev uh, to do a switch of uh, power. Meanwhile, Putin was still, you know, the president. Um, 
then maybe with the Western, they can come back to the West and we'll see going forward. But for now, with Putin, without Putin, until there are changes and that system gets broken, there needs to be an isolation and containment policy. And that's it. And then, you know, uh, and, and again, this thing is half Russian. You think you are so great? Enjoy, enjoy. You don't need to use, you know, the West. They criticize the West. And this is something I grew up in the community. They, whether inside Russia, whether living outside Russia, in the United States, they will criticize the United States. They bash United States. And it's like, okay, so if you're doing this and just go back to Russia, why are you here? You know, if you think that system is better then just, you know, live under that system, you know, and, and the only way to show the system fails is by them having no excuses that the West is behind this. And right now, you know, for all the Russians, they could blame us for whatever they want. You don't have to use our institutions. You don't have to use our financial systems. You don't have to use it. Use what you can produce. Use your own institutions and good luck. That's it. And I think that's that's one of the interesting challenges, isn't it? I, I uh, learned Russian uh, in the 90s and spent a number of years in St. Petersburg, which was uh, obviously where Putin... Uh, cut his teeth, as it were, it was the bandit central. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an interesting yeah. place to be, a mixture of freedom, crime, disorder. It, it, was, it was a fun, fun time. Um, but in the first decade of this century, there are many young Russians who only experienced that as small children and started to grow up in the large cities uh, more affluent places like Moscow and St. Petersburg, and they were able to start living more middle-class lives, uh, mm -hmm. doing middle-class things. And they were able perhaps to convince themselves that actually, you know, they've got a good standard of living, perhaps even better than they might have living in some Western cities um, because of the high cost of living here. Um, and that, you know, who needs democratic process? Who needs democratic institutions because we have a good material life. And I think, I mean, it would have been impolite, but at the time I remember thinking that everything you've got could disappear in a second because the whims, the greed of an autocrat, once they turn against you, nothing's gonna protect you. There's no property law, there's no civil rights law, there's no rule of law. All this could be gone in a blink of an eye. And no one would have really believed that. And yet that's exactly what's happened, isn't it? It's been happening, absolutely. I mean, you have it until you don't have it and you're jailed with some, you know, uh, I hate for the uh, BS charges. This is what has been happening. And again, you know, as far as, this is what, an, uh, this is why, in an autocratic system, they know how corrupt they are. This is why they park the money in the West. If they thought the system was so fantastic and fabulous, the money wouldn't be in the United States. It wouldn't be in London. It wouldn't be in Cyprus. It wouldn't be for us all of Europe and the Middle East, you know? So obviously they understand that their system is not trustworthy if they're, you know, pouring all, pulling all the money out of there. And that's why I say right now, you know, it's hard to get an indication of exactly how much of Russians support the war, but there is a good majority who do support the war. Um, we saw more outrage, which I mean, really like just, you know, angered me like beyond. We saw more outrage that they, you know, like he was closing than that their country is committing genocide next door, you know, against people that they're friends with. I mean, regardless, you know, you still have, I mean, me for, I'm the perfect example. I'm half Ukrainian, half Russian. You have a lot of intersection between the two countries, whether family members, friends live across the border from each other. Some people are just mixed, you know, and for them to not come out in the millions. And look, I understand it's dangerous, of course, you know, to go out against Putin and whatever, but if a million people came out in Moscow and stayed there every single day, like Ukrainians did when they were fighting for democracy in Maidan in 2014, you know, despite it being minus uh, degree temperature, 
there would be a threat to Putin's rule and to the system. And apparently it's not that important for them. So either they fully support it or they just don't want to be bothered. Either way, you know, that's why I say at this point, we they need to be isolated. They need to be contained. And that's it. And if you have such a perfect system, good luck. Today, you know, the gas pump shares collapsed 30%. Dividends got canceled. Perfect. Go, go enjoy your gas pump. Go enjoy the ruble. You know, how like during the Soviet Union turned to toilet paper. You know, and that's it. I mean, and uh, until we see real, and there is a percentage, unfortunately, the Russians who do want change are outside of the country. They were forced outside of the country. Because you have the Hadorkovskis and the uh, Kasparovs and, you know, uh, the Russians and the journalists who are doing amazing um, investigative work, um, but they're outside of the country, you know? So, I mean, it's difficult for them to make a change inside the country right now under these things until something happens internally where Putin's rule, you know, gets so unstable that they could return and try to help, you know, to remake the system and put in a normal system or semi-normal. There's no precise figure, is there, of how many people have left the country, but it could be anything from, you know, half a million up to four million is a figure I heard quoted. And many of these will be IT specialists, uh, people working on, say, banking infrastructure, telecommunications. Uh, it really is the sort of cream of Russia's brains and talent. And, and they've, they've, they've run, uh, which you they can run. understand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would in that position run, you know, if you don't have the majority of people who are ready to fight the autocrat, you know, I mean, Navalny stayed behind, but he stayed, went back, but he went back, you know, kind of for a message mm -hmm. to, to, to show that, you know, that he's not afraid. But in this case, individuals, it's hard for them to make a difference mm -hmm. until everybody is on board, or at least a good percentage are on board. And, you know, and with, with uh, again, Putin bringing Stalin now practices, I mean, he brought Brezhnev and Stalin and Stalin he absolutely adores, um, with him bringing the practice of having, you know, your neighbors and family uh, report you, it's even more difficult. And I mean, it's traumatizing because this is how the society, and that's another problem because from the Soviet days until like Russia, you know, like of, over the past few decades, and it's been increasingly more over the past, I would say, five years, um, the society was paranoid. There was so much paranoia. And when you saw even the KGB files, you know, unlocked, even especially in Ukraine um, from Soviet days, you saw like that it was your own family who was uh, giving you, handing you into Russian intelligence or Soviet intelligence services, that it was your neighbors, your friends. And it got to a point, you know, that living under that system, nobody knew, you know, you couldn't trust anyone. You didn't know who would make the call and who would report you. And, and then you, you know, once you got into KGB's blacklist, forget it, that, that, you know, and we're well, right back, right. aren't we? We're right back to that system. It's reputed there are more political prisoners now than under Brezhnev in the 1970s. And of course, those who have resisted, like Navalny, everyone can now see what happens to them. You've got Pivovarov, yeah. you've got uh, Karim Raza, and you've got Ilya Yashin. Yeah. They're now all behind bars, every single one of them. Every single one, because Putin is a coward and he doesn't know how to confront, you know, uh, and actually, you know, there's no platform for his party period, uh, unless you call, you know, assassinations and jailings and corruption and theft the platform. And that's it. So what's the, his only option to just remove them, jail them, assassinate them, get them out of, you know, look what he did to Nemtsov. I mean, Nemtsov was one figure that is devastating, devastating. I mean, I, I like, I could have seen him being loved by many in Russia. He was loved by many in Russia, but I could have seen him being in charge of Russia and you know having support amongst many. We haven't had that kind of figure you know, since Nemtsov, uh, Navalny, but uh, domestically he has a way smaller percentage who support him than Nemtsov. Look what Putin did, you know, had him assassinated right in front of the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So I mean, 
he's a coward. He doesn't know <laughs> his only way is, you know, like mafia to just remove anything that poses a threat to him, mm-hmm. whether it's journalists, whether it's opposition, whoever it is, you know, jail them or kill them. That's it. Pure terror. Absolutely. Now, you've been extremely generous with your time, Olga. I've got one more question, uh, and it's probably quite a short one. Um, from the start of the conflict, uh, pundits, experts, uh, not including yourself, but most pundits have got the conflict fundamentally wrong, and they continue to make the wrong calls throughout. How does this situation end? Or is it now inherently unpredictable from this point forward? I mean, the situation is just going to continue. It's not going to end um, until Russia is defeated. That's the only way. And, you know, people think, look, Ukrainians, yes, my other half, we are extremely grateful for all the support that the West is giving, for all the weapons, for everything that they've done. But if anyone in the West thinks that Ukraine will capitulate to Russia after, you know, again, this is like a centuries old fight, they're not gonna hand their territory. They have no choice. They have to continue fighting. So whether it's, you know, with HIMARS or broomsticks, they will do what they need to do in order to secure the land. And this is why people got it wrong because they looked at Russia's military, first of all, which I can believe in, honestly, all the agencies, you know, in Europe and US will have to reevaluate how they did not understand that Russia's military was as bad. But with that said, you know, they looked at Russia's military and then they looked at, um, you know, I hate call it Ukrainians and their lack of manpower and military equipment, and whatnot. And again, use the Western mindset because in the Western governments and Western society, we always look to our governments to solve everything. Countries where your freedom and your life and your existence depends on it, you will fight. There is no, you know, this is why the civil society inside of Ukraine has always been stronger than you know than the government and even you saw in 2013 when Yanukovych posed a threat you know the president of Ukraine they came out up to a million people a day every single day and it got violent and you know there were protesters who were assassinated by Yanukovych's forces but what was the result they got Yanukovych out That's it. Do you see this happening? The same thing happening in Western societies where people, I mean, we had Trump. If Trump ever was in Ukraine, he wouldn't even survive two weeks because Ukrainians would have, you know, rushed him out back to Russia or to not even Russia. He would be thrown in like Rostov or some other city. Um, They would have rushed him back, you know, out of here because, I mean, you know, that, that, and here in the United States, People here were more focused on, well, let the Department of Justice deal with it. Let this one deal with it. Let, you know, this institution deal with it. And that's where the fundamental difference is. That whereas, you know, when you didn't have freedom and you gained the freedom, you know, you will fight yourself to secure freedom. And I've always said this about Ukrainians, even prior, you know, everyone's eyes is on Ukraine and, and now. In 2014 and 15, I, you know, used to say Ukrainians fight and they will sacrifice their life in order to secure the future of their great, great grandchildren. Like they don't even need to see the result now, just the fact that they're doing it and maybe generations down, they will have a better future is enough for them to sacrifice their life, to fight, to do what they need to do. And that's it. And that's the fundamental difference between both, you know, Western thinking again and Ukrainians. We luckily have our freedoms and we're not fighting for our freedoms. We honestly, literally, especially in the United States, need to be fighting for democracy because democracy is not just, you know, hand down the silver platter and guaranteed. And we see it being challenged across the globe and we can all be in an autocracy if we turn away. And I think uh, in the UK, we have a record level of passivity in the face of uh, unprecedented corruption uh, within, uh, you know, the governance of the country. I think we have a similar problem here. On that note, Olga, I wanted to say thank you so much for speaking with me today. I wish you you. luck with the podcast. 
I'm really fascinated to see what guests you've got lined up in the coming months. <laughs> and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much.